Okay. Um, I would just like to say good afternoon to everyone. I'm Ann Carswell, the parliamentarian for Black Faculty and Staff Association. And we would just like to welcome President Pines to our uh, general body meeting. And we hope that, uh, that we can, uh, as uh, the Black Faculty and Staff, have a, a collaboratively and fruitful uh, relationship going forward. And um, just hope that everybody is being safe um, out there that's joining with us today. So at this, we would like for you, as Solomon said already, please keep your phone muted. And we will be asking the question that the Black Black and the staff board members. So I'm gonna turn it over to our president, Solomon Kamajan. Thank you. And I'll, and I'll actually briefly turn it over to Brandon Dula if you wanna give them the, uh, the rundown where they can submit their questions. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. So again, thanks for joining us today. And so as Ms. Carswell was saying, so we're gonna ask that, uh, that you all submit your questions in the chat room, and then we'll actually read those for, Pres for Dr. Pines, President Pines. And so um, as we move forward, Dr. Pines is gonna speak first, and then you, know, you all can submit questions and we'll try to ask as many as possible. I, I know he has to leave by one, and so we wanna get as many questions in as possible. So turn it back over to Solomon. Thank you, thank you. And so we'll, we'll get started now. And, and uh, just to reiterate, um, we're gonna try to get to as many questions as possible, but we have a, a, a shortened time. This is not like the town halls where, where we, you know, we're going for about 90 minutes to, to two hours. In some cases, today is, is an hour and Dr. Pines has, uh, um, you know, will be uh, with us until probably about 10 or five of, of 1, 1 p.m. And so just be mindful of that we will try to get to all the questions that we possibly can within that time after Dr. Pines, um, you know, speaks. But as uh, Brandon Dula and Ms. Carswell alluded to, you can put your questions in the chat box and um, Brandon Dula, Vice President Brandon Dula will be uh, reading the, uh, uh, the bulk of the questions out as they come in. Um, my name is Solomon Kamajan. I am the president of the Black Back and Staff Association and I wanna thank you for joining us. This is the first meeting of the, the fall semester and it's a, a most, uh, different fall semester than we've ever experienced before. And, and I hope that every, first and foremost, I hope that everyone that's on this call, that you're safe and that your loved ones, your family are safe as well, you know, during these uh, very tenuous times, you know, that we're living. Um, I want, I don't want to be remiss without giving uh, special uh, props and propers to uh, my wonderful e-board, the executive board of the Black Faculty and Staff Association, that's Brandon Dula, uh, vice president. We have Ms. Ann Reese Carswell, who is, is one of the other uh, co-moderators on this call. She's the parliament parliamentarian for uh, BFSA. We have uh, Dr. Ronald Ziegler, who is the senior advisor. We have um, Audrey Stewart, who is our non-exempt staff rep, and, and she's on the call as well. We have Tina Lowrick, who is our treasurer. Uh, handling the money and, and uh, all that good stuff. And we have Dr. Joseph Richardson, who is the um, faculty uh, representative for, for Black Faculty and Staff Association. And, and he actually is the new, uh, you know, he's the new interim chair for um, African American Studies Department. So uh, with that being said, I would like to, to you know, welcome uh, the new president of the University of Maryland on to, you know, uh, um, to our, our, our virtual our virtual BFSA meeting. Usually we do this in person and um, he's been kind enough to join us. As you know, usually when there's a new president, the president will, will come in and, and uh, spend some time with BFSA. And it's always been within the Nabruro Cultural Center, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we're doing this virtual. Uh, Dr. Pines previously was the Dean of, of of one of the top engineering schools in the country, and that's the University of Maryland School of Engineering, and uh, has now uh, stepped into the position as president of the University of Maryland, a, a very esteemed uh, position it is. And so without further ado, Dr. Pines, Dr. Darrell Pines, thank you for joining us, and I will, uh, I will uh, gladly turn it over to you. Thank you, Solomon, and thank you for the work that you do on behalf of all the Black faculty and staff of this university. And thank you to all the entire leadership of BFSA. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome back um, to the university and um, looking forward to this fall semester. 
I have a few remarks that I'm going to uh, walk through. Um, so I want to thank you, of course, for inviting me to speak today. It's a great honor to speak to this group. I've been a member of this campus community for 25 years. I'm quite familiar with the important work that the BFSSA has done over the years, uh, over my past 25 years. I already know many of you, and I'm happy to have this opportunity to spend time with those I haven't met so far, even if it's by Zoom. I'll talk more about the current COVID situation in just a moment. First, I'd just like to introduce myself to many of you. I've spent the better part of my professional career on this campus as an aerospace engineer, a department chair, and later the dean of the A. James Clark School of Engineering. I also know Marilyn as a parent. Both of my children were biology majors here, and uh, one of them is completing, the other one is still working to complete. I have great love for this university and I deeply care about our future together. I went through school as a student with a scholarship. Both of my parents grew up blue collar. We lived in a two bedroom home, three kids in one bedroom, and they made a way for us. And I got a scholarship to go to the flagship campus uh, of the University of California, Berkeley, which changed my life. Education to me is still the great equalizer for everyone. It gives any person the opportunity to be, yes, the president of the University of Maryland, which is where I'm at now. I wanna talk to you all about twin pandemics that we're facing. For months before I moved into the president's office, I spent a lot of time listening to a lot of folks carefully across this campus, faculty, staff, students, I had listening sessions. I had created this wonderful team of folks, a transition team to help advise me. Um, little did I know that two pandemics would make sure that we were only meeting by Zoom. Um, they gripped the nation, afflicted our campus and upended our lives. When the virus came, everything changed, seriously changed. People could not literally breathe. It even took very important distinguished members of our community away from us like Dr. David Driscoll. It isolated all of us, made us fear one another. Then a viral video further inflamed millions of us. In a single moment, people stared at an image of our nation's heritage of racial, ethnic, and other social injustices. Both pandemics took our entire breath away. As a research university, we have an unshakable mission to heal these twin pandemics, these twin infections, both on our campus and beyond. This is work we must do together, all of us, faculty, staff, and students. It simply calls us to act. In this and all our work and activities, we must strive for excellence. Half-hearted efforts this time simply won't cut it. To help our students think about this and the entire faculty and staff think about it, on day one, I decided to lay out 12 initiatives to address some of these, these issues. The first one was mental health. So to help our students cope, I decided I would wanted to increase our services and, mental sta and our staffing for mental services, health services. We also work towards fundraising to support our students in what we call the crisis fund for need-based scholarships to keep with our mission of access and affordability for all of our students who have a financial need. To make the campus more inclusive and welcoming I wrote out, or I am rolling out now, a program which I'm calling the Terrapin Strong Program. Every new member of our community, students, faculty, and staff will get this formal introduction to our campus history, ideals, and expectations. It will include training to deal with unconscious bias and racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion training, as well as understanding sexual harassment. We have done this program successfully in engineering for the past three to four years. So I'm simply expanding it to be campus-wide with some autonomy in the individual units and colleges. No one, no one can afford to be willful or blind to these concerns anymore. I'm working to name our newest residence halls in honor of two African-American pioneers, trailblazers, who were among the first to live on our campus in the 1950s as the state of Maryland began to desegregate. Those two individuals named include Hiram Whittle, and Elaine Johnson Coates. The chilled silence and open hostility that these pioneers endured required great courage during that time and can inspire students today. I also want to recognize that the first two Asian American students who experienced their own special challenges will also be named uh, or have their names on the other, the other new dormitory or residence hall. We will also strengthen our curriculum in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
and have authentic conversation about anti-racism included in our coursework. The University Senate and its Diversity and Respect Task Force will ensure shared governance as we do this important work to be inclusive in our curriculum. We have begun a series of steps to enhance community policing. Police Chief David Mitchell agreed with me on the first day that we should end the Defense Department's program 1033 that gives old military equipment to campuses. It has now been debarred and debanded from our campus. It has no place here. Also with Chief Mitchell's support, we're forming, forming an inclusive task force to review all police procedures, especially those that involve force, including use of pepper spray, chokeholds, and interactions with other police agencies. It will also look at enhancing anti-bias training for every officer. We're working actively to enhance student, faculty, and staff diversity. Our admissions office has been systematically recruiting this year more diverse group of incoming students than ever in history. That includes a 6% increase in African Americans. Their efforts are paying off, but we're still waiting for the final numbers to come in as the students arrive back to campus and enroll in our courses. We believe that will be the highest diversity in the history collectively for all minorities. It'll be about 48% of the total population of our incoming class. Another top priority, increasing diversity among faculty, researchers and staff. Here too, we are actively recruiting and if we were not having a hiring increase, we'll have a plan in place. I am continuing a series of listening sessions through the fall to hear your concerns and talk through ways to make this campus a more inclusive and welcoming to all in the future. These sessions represent a beginning a prelude to a more open campus community. To strengthen our connection with our neighbors in Prince George's County, we are working closely with authorities and the county executive. I now chair a county education recovery subcommittee on behalf of the county executive that I hope will increase the pipeline of students to our campus and improve the public school systems in Prince George's County. We are working very closely with the city and county officials to prevent outbreaks of COVID as, as I will discuss in just a moment. Finally, Finally, very importantly, I urge you all to vote in November. Our students and our student athletes are actively working to increase turnout. It is the one sure action each of us can take to influence the world around us and the world in the future. We will be having polling sites on our campus in three locations, Stamp, Xfinity, and in um, a Record Armory as well. Now, you might ask the question, why reopen the flagship? It is almost unbelievable that for the past six months, a microscopic virus has nearly shut down the entire planet. It will not go away anytime soon. Even when we, if and when we get a vaccine, we will need to learn to live with COVID-19 because it will take time for the efficacy of the vaccine to hold. Throughout the summer, an army of staff, faculty, students, and other administrators from across the campus have worked incredibly hard with incredible diligence that includes many of you participating today, cleaning and sanitizing and digging into minute details to determine how to proceed for the fall semester. How many classrooms on campus have the capacity to socially distance 30 students? The answer, not many. Making testing arrangement, arrangements for everyone free Tracking data, monitoring wastewater in our, in our buildings, tracking the aerosols in our buildings, tracking the surfaces of where the virus might exist in our buildings by our researchers. All of this has been going on all summer long. And I thank everyone involved in this heroic work to bring us back and return to campus. The task is even more difficult because there are sharp differences in what people want. Some of you here today need to minimize all contact because you are at higher risk of infection. You might have a pre-existing health condition. You might be immune compromised. I totally understand that and I totally respect that. And I'm very sensitive to individual concerns of individual faculties and staff. Others need to keep working and cannot do it from home and must do it in person. Many students crave for the camaraderie and the experience that they would have only on if the physical campus is open. Many additional students need to be here as a safe haven, especially those from the inner city and those from rural America who crave the community that our university affords them so they have a safe environment to reach their full potential in education. But working closely with local and county authorities, we have come up with a hybrid approach like many other US flagship campus. It includes lots of surveillance measures, 
so we can quickly and turn on a dime if needed and pivot to fully online, which we don't really wanna do. The key to making this work, however, is rigorous testing. We will be testing everyone on this campus multiple times this semester, everyone. All students, faculty, and staff must test negative to come back to campus. Then they must get another test in two more weeks down the road. We will start a clean campus with, it, with a clean campus and negative uh, tests all around. We don't want to import the virus to our community. So far, more than uh, we've had more than 4,800 tests now, and we've had a grand total of eight positive cases. So everyone is doing a great job, and that's up until today, Tuesday. So here's the rationale. You might ask, why again am I opening a physical campus? And, and we've gone over this time and time again. I believe we have to learn how to live with the virus as best as we can. It will remain a threat for, you, for humanity for the immediate future into the spring semester of next year, into the fall semester of next year. The risks and fears I, I hear from all of you, I know they're real. They're real for me. And those who do not want to come in, I totally understand. And we've tried to be very flexible with all of you for the jobs that you do. I share your fears and your concern. On the other side of the scale, there are real risks and costs locking down the campus. And I'm looking for a reasonable combination of the balance of the health side on one side and the ability to minimize the risks on the other side. We know quite well what other campuses are doing in the DMV region and around the country. Many of the problems that you have seen on television have come because the testing program was inadequate or campus officials ignored recommendations from their local health officials. We are doing neither of that. We are listening to our local health officials and we are doing an exhaustive amount of testing for everyone on this campus. I've come to campus myself every day for the past 10 weeks because of course my work requires that. I too, like you, crave safety, but also deserve a quality of life that reaches beyond the four walls of my home. With your cooperation and the cooperation of all students, I seek to achieve both. If we all maintain what I call for Maryland healthy behaviors. Now, the realities are real. The virus is real, but we must be each other's keeper. We have done a really good job in preparing for the return to campus this fall. We've prepared a really good plan, but now we need for every citizen to really abide by the for Maryland healthy behaviors that we have laid out. That includes wearing a mask, maintaining social distancing, making sure that you maintain personal hygiene, washing your hands multiple times a day, and finally monitoring your symptoms. And if you don't feel well, do not come to work. Do not come to work, right? So I know this is all challenging time for everyone, but as the university president, I think we have a right and we owe it to ourselves to try to make this work because I definitely believe that the virus is gonna be around for a very long period of time. And I believe we have created an environment that's safe for everyone to the best of our ability as to what we know today. And I look forward to speaking to you about your questions. And I thank you for the opportunity to present and I'll turn it back to Solomon to, for questions. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, appreciate that. And with that being start, started, I will turn it to, to Brandon Dula. Um, there, I'll, somebody sent me a question privately and if you can send the questions directly either to Brandon Dula or in the main chat, because he'll be asking the bulk of the questions, but someone um, I think uh, sent the first message and it was, it was sent directly to me and I'll, um, I'll ask their question. Um, it says, uh, there is a very serious culture of sy uh, systemic racism and discrimination that is prevalent at UMCP. I'm personally going through a horrible racism slash discrimination case presently. While Dr. Lowe moved things in the right direction, how do you plan to deal with this very ser serious issue during your administration? First, I would say uh, for, the, for the person who was potentially having a current problem, that they should definitely file a complaint or a grievance in the appropriate office, that's number one. And no one should be afraid to do that. Uh, you can do that in multiple ways. You can do it obviously anonymously and it starts the process of an investigation. So I think that's really important that people should know that they have the freedom to do that and they should do that. Um, I think MI12 initiatives should give you the signal that I care about this problem. I don't know how one could not see that on day one 
from the initiatives that I, I laid out and from I just and just what I just spoke to you about about all the issues that are faced in our society, especially those related to social injustice. So it will be top of mind for me to make sure that we can root out systematic racism throughout our university and make it an incredibly inclusive environment and so that every person, faculty, staff, and student can reach their full potential and be successful. Thank you. Brandon? Okay. Dr. Pines, the next question is from Nathaniel Sims. How and when will we be notified daily where a person or persons tested positive for COVID-19? Could you say that again? How and when will we be notified daily where a person or persons tested positive for COVID-19? So I, I don't understand the premise of the question. Let me just try to say broadly what's going on. So we've created a transparent dashboard, uh, Nathaniel, that you can go and look at every day on a website, which tells you how many folks at University of Maryland has been tested per week, per day, and it tells you how many people have tested positive. Now the individuals who are too test positive, it's confidential to them, it's a privacy issue. So they get notified directly by the head physician of our University Health Center, Dr. Sacred Bodison. So if you test positive, faculty, staff, or student, you receive a phone call from Dr. Bodison immediately. And then you'll be told to isolate. If you're a student, you'll be told to isolate on campus. We've created a couple of residence halls that we're using to isolate our students and quarantine our students to create a safe environment for all parties and then let them be in those environments for about two weeks. And then they come back and they have to get tested again before they can come back to their normal residence uh, hall where they were, or even if they're off campus. So that's the process. I hope that answers your question. Okay, next question. Was there any resolve with the issue of the two students who carried out the George Floyd challenge? I don't know what you're referring to. We'll move on from that. If, 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 if for a one tail, can you provide more information and we'll try to maybe come back to that. Next question. How can presidential postdocs earn your support in implementing the presidential postdoctoral post fellowship as a direct hiring and recruitment pipeline? Yeah, I think um, the presidential postdoctoral uh, program that was implemented before I started did not achieve its full potential and that won't happen under my term. Next. Okay, uh, next question. So I, I, I sort of paraphrase this. So how is the university going to make sure that docs bus drivers will be kept safe and have full information as students return to campus? And, and so I don't understand the premise of that question either. So, so uh, a, a, uh, a drivers came back to work. Many, many. So many didn't have safeguard stickers, I guess. Didn't have stickers on the buses? Right, the, the safeguard, yeah, the, the, the bus was fantasized. I think they, they, I think the idea there is to work through the Department of Transportation, uh, which is uh, led by uh, Mr. David Allen, and to make sure, and I'll talk, if, if you like, I'll talk to David Allen and make sure that all these issues are resolved as it relates to uh, our transportation uh, providers uh, on our buses. Okay. So I'll take it as an action. Okay. Next question for Maria. I work at UMD as a part of the housekeeping staff, but I have kids I need to take care of at home because in person school isn't happening. How is UMD going to help workers who have children needs and are forced to choose between the jobs and kids? I think this is the biggest challenge that everybody has, not just our housekeeping staff, every human being on this Zoom call. If you have young children, it doesn't matter what your job is, it is very complicated, the work-life balance issues. So what I would recommend is that you will try to be very flexible with you. You have to work with your supervisors. They've all been communicated about this very sensitive issue about the work-life balance of, of parents who have to take care of their children because their, work, their children are small and they need supervision. They might not be able to afford childcare. So, and then that, the, even bigger than that is many of them have to actually um, provide some teaching to their students and to their, to their children, which is even more work than just doing their normal job. So I would recommend that you work very closely with your supervisor Try to uh, allow that flexibility so that you can take care of your children while also doing uh, your, your job here at Maryland. And maybe it involves some flexible changes of your hours, but I, I would work with my supervisor. Okay, next question from Jane. What are important technical skills or soft skills for silver engineer students to work on 
while looking for employment. For civil engineering students? Yes. I mean, soft skills is, um, you know, I think they'll be part of teams as they take classes here at the University of Maryland. And in those classes, as you're working on capstones and other project design teams, you'll get those soft skills of working with your uh, fellow peers. Um, we offer leadership, you know, training in those courses. You'll get um, skills as it relates to project management, how to build a successful teams and execute uh, projects in those environments. Okay, from Audrey Stewart, due to COVID-19 pandemic issue, where any non-exempt employees have to fear for job loss? Not at this time, but, but let me tell you, so let me tell you the seriousness of the situation that we're facing. So all of you know this and you hear directly from me. We are facing the worst financial crisis in the history of the University of Maryland, bar none. No other person can ever tell me it's been worse than what it is today. It is a couple hundred million dollar deficit. And let me just say what we've done for everyone. So everybody knows and you hear it from me. Everyone says we're opening this campus because of money. We're not opening this campus because of money. We're opening this campus because we care about everyone. And we think we've balanced the risk mitigation as I mentioned in my opening remarks. But let me tell you, if we go fully online, a lot of people, hundreds of people are gonna lose their jobs. Hundreds of people are going to lose their jobs. So you ask Pines, which is me, why am I doing what I'm doing? Because I care about all of you. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it's important that you know that. And we cared about you in the spring. Why? Because when many folks who are forward facing to the work that you do, some of the work that you do on our campus, we paid your full salaries. Until now, we paid your full salaries and kept everyone employed. So we think we've developed a really good, identified our campus plan to move forward. And, but you should understand that if we were to go fully online, unfortunately, a lot of folks are gonna lose their jobs. Right now, that isn't the case. And this is part of our reasons, trying to help everyone maintain their employment, service our students, deliver a high quality education that's de-densified and safe for all parties. It is a complicated juggling act, but that's the juggling act we're performing. Next from Saul Walker, why isn't UMD bargaining with the union about health and safety? That's an issue for the lawyers to talk about. Um, and I, the person who asked that should discuss that with their uh, lawyer, having the lawyers talk to our lawyers. Okay, and another union question. So why were union members and leaders excluded from most reopening committees, considering they are the ones most at risk? I don't think that was done at all intentionally. Our, our committees were very diverse. They'd include faculty, staff, and students, and they were on all, every working group. Now, if there were some folks that were not on the union, that was definitely not done purposely. Um, the working group started before I came, became president. I inherited them, but I looked at all of them. They had multiple uh, diversity of membership on those committees, um, and we did all these decisions in a shared way. So if um, folks who feel that uh, somehow they were cheated. We, we feel unfortunate about that because it definitely wasn't purposeful. Um, and definitely going forward, we'll try to correct that if that's the case. Okay, so I'm going to move down. So the next question is, why is UMD still paying an outside union busting attorney during a time of economic crisis to fight frontline workers who just want to be safe? I, I think that's not, a, uh, that's not a question that deserves the answer. I mean, I think that's a, a baiting question that's not necessary at this time. Uh, next question, please. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, will there be hazardous pay for employees who have to work in the student quarantine area and the student isolation area? I think um, my understanding at this point now is that we may actually be hiring contractors uh, to do that work, and at least for the students who are isolated. So it wouldn't involve necessarily Maryland employees. Okay, what is the plan for disinfecting dorms and classroom throughout the day and through the night? So we have a plan where, um, you know, every day when a class turns over, um, we have supplied uh, essentially the uh, classrooms with uh, wipes for, for cleaning down the death surfaces, 
uh, where students will be sitting down. So the students will do it to, on their own after each class. So that's one thing in which the sort of class setting um, where they sit down, chairs, tables will be clean with wipes uh, on a sort of hourly basis every time the class turns over. And then at night, I think it would be just general housekeeping. It's not any different than that. But once, you know, I don't think we're doing anything special. It'll be just general housekeeping. Okay, I'll ask the next question. I'm not sure if you answer it. As president, could you sit down, draw union, know the lawyers, and negotiate about our health and safety? Everything, directives, rules that come out have not had people like us at the table. We should be heard. So, so let me say, I've been in this job for eight weeks, Brandon. I've met with the union twice. That hasn't ever happened before in the history of their interactions with the university president. So I think that should answer your question. Okay. I'm going to come back to this next one. And let me, let me just say this. Um, you've now asked me four union sort of kind of questions. Um, let's move to some other substantial questions as well, because I think let's be balanced in the way you're asking these questions, because I don't think this is us versus them mentality. So please, you know, tone it down. I mean, it's, it's unnecessary. Okay, I'm going to skip one and I'll come back to it in a second. So I asked this one from Dr. Brown. Why is the university saying offices should be open nine to five, but making no plans for bathrooms except to be cleaned and sanitized after 12 noon? I mean, I don't know what to say to that question. I mean, I mean, I think um, what frequency should they be cleaned? I, I, I'm not understanding the question. Okay. I'll move down and I'll come back to this. Uh, Let me just say this. Uh, so if everyone in our community, right, this, this is our, if we're testing everyone in our community, everyone, and everyone, if they test positive, you go into isolation or you you're forced to stay at home, then on a given day, a given population, everyone should be negative on the campus. Are you with me for a second? Okay. So the fear of now, you know, someone carrying the virus should be minimal on our environment if we've tested everyone, okay? And we're testing a lot of people. And everyone's, all of us on this call is, are monitoring our symptoms on a daily basis, making sure that we don't come to campus if we're not feeling well. So um, again, you know, I wanna say something. I've been on this campus, like I said, for 10 weeks. I've gone everywhere. I've talked to everybody. I've talked to housekeeping staff. I've talked to maintenance staff. I've met with faculty. I've met with student athletes. I've been in environments that you might consider to be potentially hazardous. Um, what I can tell everyone to help alleviate your fears, and I know the fear is real, is generally the campus is very, very safe. Very, very, all the buildings are very, very safe. The virus is transmitted from humans through the air. And this is why we're asking everyone to social distance, wear a face mask all the, at all times, right? Practice these healthy behaviors because we know how it's transmitted. And all these healthy behaviors can prevent the transmission on our campus. With that said, we still have an above board measure, which is to test everyone. And so that on this incredible uh, weekly basis, we're gonna be testing people constantly to make sure that the virus on our campus doesn't grow or spread. So I just want everybody to know that a number of preventative measures are being put in place to ensure that this doesn't happen. Okay, I'm moving back up. I'm gonna paraphrase the question from Tim. Well, it's welcome news that you support the divestment from the 1033 program my question is why you support UMD having a police force at all, unlike most higher education institutions across the world that do not? I, I don't think that statement is accurate. I think most universities either have a police force or, or they use the local municipality police force to help patrol their university if you do the statistics. Um, I have called for a uh, task force to review our procedures for community policing and so that this task force will bring back recommendations about how we might improve our police force and its interactions with our community to make sure that there are no racial profiling is happening and making sure that our community feels safe with our current police force. 
So I'm about to announce that committee and that task force, uh, hopefully sometime early next week, um, as we get started and they get started on their really good work on behalf of all of us. Okay, from Gabrielle, what is the plan if there is a major outbreak on campus? Great question. So um, we will be working very closely with our Prince George's County uh, public health officials. And if a significant outbreak either is either on campus or off campus, by the way, we will consult them on the next phasing of possible restrictions. So one example could be that if the outbreak is on campus, like in a residence hall or in a couple of residence halls, then we may go fully online. We may keep our students in the residence hall who have not been affected by the outbreak uh, in quarantine for a couple of weeks. And at a worst state, if it gets really bad, then we would um, slowly release them to go home to their families. Um, and then we would tell all faculty and staff to, um, like we did it in the spring, essentially uh, don't return to campus if it was really that bad. It'll be a phased approach as we make um, these complicated decisions. Okay, uh, from Fuller, Maine. You spoke about partnership with Prince George's County and public schools. I grew up in PG and was an undergraduate here, the first and, and only six of siblings to attend the university. I'm excited about the news that you shared. Can you speak a little bit more about the partnership? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's, it's several folks. So the, the College of Education has signed an agreement with Prince George's County Public School Systems in multiple ways. So I'll tell you what we're doing. We, we're doing something even really cool um, this fall for, um, for the high school students. So one of the problems that we've heard about uh, in Prince George's County and many of the high schools, and when it went online and Zoom, many of the students struggled in mathematics. And we wanted to find a way in which the University of Maryland can help. So what we decided to do, we're offering our math uh, 140 course, which is Calculus One, to I think seven high schools in the county, free of charge to any student who takes the course. And we're providing free tutorial services to all the students that are in the program throughout the county. And we wanted to do that because we wanted to address a need. We saw there was a need for this particular course and do good service to the county. But in a larger context, our um, Dean of the College of Edu Education, um, uh, Jennifer Rice has signed a collaborative agreement with Prince George County Public School Systems where we will be training uh, their teachers and how to be more effective and efficient in the online modality that we're all in now. Um, they're making sure that they can deliver a high quality product because of course, as you know, most of the K-12 systems are online. So that's a collaboration with the county. And then furthermore, we will be de 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 developing a few other partnerships between uh, the high schools and the University of Maryland where we'll be delivering some of our courses to them again for free um, to help them uh, find a pathway into either Prince George's Community College or a pathway into a four-year institution like the University of Maryland. What precautions were being made for people who are not associated with the campus uh, being able to come in and out of buildings and moving forward? Yeah, great question. Um, so for all the contractors that you'll see around our campus, all of them are on a master list. We know who they are uh, for all the different capital and renovation projects that we're doing on campus. And then other couriers are asked to sign in and all of them, by even the contractors that are working on our campus right now on the capital projects, have to have a COVID test weekly. And it's done by their uh, construction firm or their particular firm. The other ones that are coming on campus, we ask them whether they tested negative or positive for COVID. So there is a, uh, if, if, you're, if, you are, if you're faculty and staff and you're bringing a visitor to campus, we ask that you uh, get the information about that visitor and that we, it, it gets logged into your unit and then it gets back to the campus level. So we know who's coming to our campus so that we can check whether they are obviously COVID positive, COVID negative. So there is a process. Okay. What is your vision for UMD fundraising and do you support, um, uh, do you support trying to engage black alumni to support uh, fundraising? Absolutely. Uh, a number of black alumni have already reached out to me saying that they're willing to launch scholarship funds on behalf of minority students on our campus. Um, many of them have already contributed to this crisis fund, which is a need-based scholarship in this moment of crisis of the pandemic that many students and their parents have unfortunately lost their jobs and are unable to pay for tuition. By the way, I should also say that fortunately we've got CARES money, $10.7 million of CARES money was used to help students in need for scholarships or financial aid 
to actually allow them to come back this fall and continue their education. So I should say that we are also in line, hopefully, if the next CARES version of the act goes through, to get even more money for our students going forward um, for this fall. Will COVID testing after September be optional or mandatory? All testing is mandatory. And so what we're gonna do now, we're doing the big baseline testing now. And then in about uh, two weeks from now, we'll do another big group of testing of everyone again, uh, definitely 100% of the students. And then after that, so after the two big baseline testings, first now, and then in about two weeks, then right after that, every week we'll be doing about a thousand tests and it would be what we call surveillance and sentinel tests. Uh, Cause at that point we will think that the statistically we will drop the likelihood of uh, the presence of COVID in our environment. And so we'll be testing strategically different groups of people. So say the students that are living in the residence halls, we'll test them. Um, certain groups where we think they have potentially could be a high, higher incidence of COVID, we'll test those groups. It's called sentinel testing. We'll do a thousand tests per week. Um, and then, uh, you know, see where we are probably in about four or five weeks. Okay. How can we help you in trying to accomplish the things you listed in your opening sta statement? Well, a number of you are already helping me, <laughs> um, which is exciting. Um, of those 12 initiatives, I would say eight of them are already fully running, almost fully running. Um, so Terrapin Strong is definitely running. We're waiting, I'm waiting for a proposal from, um, Vice President Georgina Dodge and in collaboration with Vice President Patty Ferrillo on the mental health services and the numbers and, and what people they want to hire. So that's moving along. Um, on the uh, of access to the campus, diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion, um, I'm working with Barbara Gill and Shannon uh, Gundy on the admissions part, both transfer students and uh, obviously freshmen. So that's going very well. Um, I will need help with the faculty um, in your units so for the faculty on this call working with your unit chairs to really make this a, a large initiative that we're going to move forward. Now, once it'll happen, once we, re, we lift the hiring freeze and we get approval to lift the hiring freeze for faculty and staff, but right now we're just developing the process and the program. So we'll need help on that. Um, and so, and then of course, uh, encourage alums to, to, to donate uh, for scholarships, for need-based scholarships, and maybe participate in the Maryland um, Promise Program where you, if you give a dollar, it gets matched by a dollar from the uh, Clark Challenge program. So if you had a half a million dollars, uh, you would get another half a million, so you'd have a million dollar scholarship. Do you have any, do you have any potential timeline or idea of when we were hearing an update of the overall budget situation for the campus? Yeah, very good question. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for asking that question. So we have been waiting for, for like four or five weeks uh, from the governor's office to for the governor to release the budget for the state. We don't want to go ahead of the governor because um, politically it would not be good. Um, the governor, um, just to let you all know, the governor has been in collaborations and conversations um, with the union. And I think that's what's held it up is they haven't come to a, an agreement. And maybe, maybe it's happened already, but I wasn't aware of that last week. And that is what's been holding up the final decisions. But once that agreement, I think, is established with uh, the union, union um, going forward, then the budget will be released by, by the governor's office. And then when, when that happens, then the chancellor will give us permission to speak to our community about the state of our budget. What committees do you have in place to address racism on campus and how are members selected for those committees? Well, I think the Office of the Diversity and Inclusion is the first point of interaction to address any issue uh, that you're having relative to, to racism. I think uh, we also have, uh, you know, if you are filing an agreement again, as I mentioned earlier, that you should uh, get in, in contact with the appropriate uh, office for you um, to file that grievance. Um, but I don't have a standing committee on racism, uh, per se. Okay, this is kind of a follow up to the, I guess, the earlier question. So a, a staff member asked, what happens if your supervisor doesn't support uh, work life balance in terms of childcare? Then I, I think you have to, you know, talk to that person's supervisor um, because that's the next step. I mean, it's a serious issue. All of our people have been told that this is a serious issue for everybody. It's for everybody. You know, this is the most complicated situation we all have ever faced with the work-life balance in the history of our university. 
So everyone has to be flexible and sensitive to these issues. It's complicated. People are under a lot of stress. Uh, first, you're under stress under the virus. Then you're under stress under financial conditions. Then you're under stress because your children have to stay at home and be in the background of your Zoom call. Um, you know, it, 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 it's crazy for everyone. We all know it. So I would say take it to the next level. This is sort of a follow-up to the first question uh, from Wantel. So I uh, was talking about the George Floyd challenge. So there were two students at UMD who mocked, I guess, the George Floyd killing and was trying to find out what happened to those students. Is it going to be resolved? I do not know, uh, so I'll have to look into that. I think the issue, I think, was sent to the Office of Student Conduct, and I'm not sure if those students were reprimanded, but I can find out. And I can get back to you, Brandon. Okay. Uh, let's see. Moving on. Uh, uh, someone asked a question, so uh, how can how can folks be hired? Uh, well, I, I can't really, I'm trying to, I can't decipher that, sorry. Let me move back up. Uh, I guess a, a question from Saba, so will you publicly acknowledge Black Terps Matter? What does that mean, public acknowledge? Saba, I talk to you every, every time you respond to me, I talk to you all the time, so therefore I'm acknowledging you. I met with you, I, I showed up at the protest, Thursday before the first day I started on the job. Um, but what do you mean by acknowledging Black? Of course I have acknowledged Black Terps Matter. Of course I have acknowledged Black Lives Matter. What, what, are you, what are you getting at? I don't understand the question. Sorry, can I tune in here since he's talking to me? No, it's... I mean, just because he literally said my name and was talking to me, that's all. I want to reply real quick. So what I meant by please publicly acknowledge Black Terps Matter is the fact that I emailed you in your office eight separate times in the past two months about various issues across the Black community. I did. Issues ranging from the thing that you eventually added into your initiative, like the increase of admitted Black students. But I've also talked about how the administration building was recently renamed. That's a big issue for me. I'd like to talk to someone from your office or you about that so you can understand the severity of this for the black students at the University of Maryland. In addition to that, this whole thing about you not knowing about the George Floyd situation, for me, that hurts. Because me and my black peers that actually go to this school had to sit and look on Instagram to see two non-Black students mocking a national situation. We had to see that over and over again until we could try and find justice for George Floyd. Black students knew about that. So President Pines, if you were talking to me, you would know about that, I promise. But the people that you are talking to, whoever they may be, are not telling you about these situations. So if we could have a standing meeting once a month I would absolutely love to tell you about my perspective about these issues that are impacting Black students on our campus most. Saba, thank you for your comments. Um, I just met with all of you, Saba, so you, you will acknowledge the fact that I met with 30 African American student leaders, which included you. There's no way that the president of the University of Maryland can meet with one individual student leader all the time. It's not possible especially in two pandemics, number one, and in financial crisis. But I just met with all of you and I asked you, what did I ask you, Saba? I'll say, I'll tell everyone so they know what I asked you. I said, I have received a list of requests and concerns from 30 different African-American student leaders. And what I said, and Brandon was there as well, I said, work together with your fellow student leaders, prioritize the issues that are the highest priority to this community to the black community, and then come back to me with those issues and those are the ones I'm gonna work on, including those from the Black Terps Matter movement and those from the Black Lives Matter movement. That's what I said. And Brandon was there to validate what I said. Brandon was there and what I'd like to say about uh, that- Bob, I do not wanna go back and forth with you on this call. So Brandon, can you please stay control of the situation? Yeah, move on, move on. Move on. All right, so, so uh, I know Dr. Dr. Pines has to leave, but uh, I guess a question about uh, classes starting online Monday. So we'll be switching to online class at some point in time during the semester. I hope not. I hope that if we all follow healthy behaviors, work together as a community, 
that we can still have the physical campus fully open, keep our COVID count very low, take care of one another, care about one another, like I care about all of you, and do our best to get to the end of the semester, the best of our ability. That's what I hope. Here's kind of an, maybe an important one from one staff member. So any chance of an early retirement for people who've been here for 30 years or more? That's a very good question. Um, that we, we have had some discussions about that with our uh, system. Um, we hope that they will have those discussions with the uh, governor's office and the Department of Budget and Management so that we can pull together a retirement program for those who might want to retire uh, in the next year or so. But we don't have an answer today. It's a work in progress. Okay, I'll paraphrase this from Dr. Kim Nickerson. So uh, if students have large parties off campus, what's going to be the response of the university? A very good question, uh, Dr. Nickerson. Thank you for asking that question. So we have been working extremely hard with the City of College Park in Prince Rivers County. Um, and we have also um, are going to leverage our student code of conduct. So we have obviously sent out a series of messages to our students about large gatherings and parties and apartment complexes, both indoor, outdoor, uh, large gatherings, anywhere in the community of City of College Park. You can literally be suspended if you host a large gathering or even participate. Are, um, we're going to be very severe if something's really egregious with our students. We've communicated to them. If they, again, if we all don't abide by these healthy behaviors, then we are going to go online, which we all don't want to do. Um, and so we're trying to work with our students. We're trying to communicate. We de-densified the uh, residence halls. We de-densified the Greek and sorority houses. So they only have half of what they used to have in those buildings. We've communicated to the Greek life folks. We, we talked to the property managers of Terrapin Road, the Varsity, the View, the Landmark, the Alloy, all of the large apartment complexes around College Park. We hope that they will be vigilant in enforcement, but if that doesn't work, we have two mechanisms for us. One is the student code of conduct, and the other one is there's an ordinance in the city of College Park for noise abatement, and if you violate that, you can get severe repercussions as well. So. And I'll, I sort of paraphrase this from Esther. So uh, what's being done to, to ensure that the school is becoming more anti-racist? Again, all the initiatives that I, I just laid out to you. Next question. I'm trying to move around, let's we'll see. Okay. We have time for a couple, one or two more. So I, I want to ask the question from, I guess, from the Black Faculty Staff Association. So in, in the past, uh, the administration of the university used to meet with uh, BFSA, I guess, yearly or bi-yearly. And so we're hoping that can happen again, because uh, many of the, the things that happened at UMD came about because of BFSA. So hopefully we would like to meet with the entire, you know, uh, a presidential cabinet. I think we can have a panel discussion maybe later this semester with a few people that you might uh, want to hear from. Um, and, and then maybe do it again next semester. So I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Um, I think that that is, you know, we're right up against it. It's uh, about four minutes to 1 p.m. And, and we said we're going to be um, ending the dialogue with, with uh, Dr. Pines roughly around um, five of. And so uh, on behalf of uh, Black Faculty and Staff Association, want to thank you and, and look forward to, as Brandon said, continuing the dialogue, um, you know, further down the line on the semester, because, uh, you know, personally, I can say that BFSA has been on the front lines with a lot of progress, a lot of uh, different struggles, you know, social justice struggles and struggles on behalf of, of students and faculty and staff of color for, for quite some time, you know, long before I even came on campus, but certainly during um, my administration with the e-board and, and the, the wonderful people that we've worked with, the coalition that we've worked with, students, you know, union and, and otherwise, and community members. So I look forward to um, hopefully having a uh, transparent and, and strong working relationship with, with your cabinet, you know, to try to advance this university to where it needs to be. Thank you, Solomon. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, President Pines, before you go, this is Ann Carswell. I would just like to say, uh, yeah, once again, thank you for coming to be with us today. And also wanted to ask 
as some of our former presidents have done, if you would become a member of the Black Faculty Staff Association, and it's only twenty dollars a year. Okay, not a problem. <laughs> done. Uh, we have one to get time. Follow and send me a link where I can go register. All right. Thank okay. you. All right. Thanks so much. All right. Take care. Take care, everyone. Have a good day. Bye. You Bye -bye. too. Have a good day. All right. Thank you. So, um, as we follow up, uh, Brandon, <laughs> hold on. I'll be right back. I've got the conversation. <laughs> okay. Um, Ms. Carl, at this point, we're going um, to we're going to go to to uh, um, uh, use the announcements and and if there's any uh, uh, follow up from the meeting, if anyone wants to chime in uh, very quickly. Um, A couple minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly. And Do you and you can ask a question. You don't have to type it in now. If someone, you can, you can kind of raise your hand and, and type it in, and uh, Ms. Carswell will see you, and Brandon will see you. Um, but while they're doing that, I, I do want to let folks know that, um, as an announcement, because of COVID, as you know, because of COVID, we were not able to have the, um, the BFSA conference that was scheduled in April. So we were supposed to have a BFSA conference scheduled in April, and that kind of upended things. And so what we're doing right now is be, because of all these different, um, it's just an awful, awful situation that we've been in, but I think that a lot of us have learned a, a lot of different new skill sets. And so one of the things that we've learned is, is how to actually have meetings effectively on campus. And so what we're planning right now, our executive board is we're, we're planning to have that conference virtually with breakout rooms, with speakers and, and, and so forth, uh, um, speakers from, from the union that will have uh, breakout room, you know, I think Stuart Katzenberg was on and Sally Davies and Saul Walker, uh, a breakout room about knowing your rights, you know, Don Mitchell and, and so forth. And then there'll be breakout rooms, you know, on different areas um, that we're going to cover during the, the, during the conference. And so that's in the works. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, and so Ms. Carswell, I don't know if you, there's another announcement or if anybody wants to um, say no. something else. Okay. This is all, and I'd like to say um, to you, Solomon and Ms. Coswell, uh, thanks again because what y'all are doing is really needed. You know, um, BFSA is um, doing a good job and keeping everybody in tune together at the university. You know, so thank y'all again. All right, thank you. No problem. Okay. Bye. Sorry. That's it. Bye. Thank you all. Wait, wait, what? Uh, we have one more. I'm, uh, Esther, I'm sorry. Esther, want, you know, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought this went for two hours. This, oh, no, uh, no th this is the meeting. The, so the, the, uh, the town halls usually go from 90 minutes to about 120 minutes. And so this is our, our um, general body meeting. So, but we will be having another town general hall. Body. December. But if you want to, if you, you know, don't worry about it. I know you don't. Oh. That, so you're going to ask the question. Okay, so this is my first time here, and um, this was really good. Um, I have to say that it was also really disappointing, um, and um, but I am new to higher ed, um, so I'm not sure um, what all I should have really expected. Um, but I'm with SPP. Um, I just graduated a couple of years ago. Um, so I was definitely a, a later in life um, uh, bachelor's uh, graduate, and I just got my master's. Um, but I wanted to know, since um, everyone here is from different, you know, different schools, um, different positions, staff, faculty, one of the issues that we're having at SPP, um, trying to create an anti-racist environment, is getting buy-in from faculty, uh, from tenured faculty. And, um, you know, it's my experience prior to, to getting my degree was in the private sector. And um, because of that, um, it's obviously I transfer those skills over here. And a lot of what happens in higher ed doesn't necessarily make the most sense. So I'm wondering um, if at all, uh, and that's what I, what I wanted to ask, um, uh, I want to call him principal, but um, President Pines um, is what's happening. Like, what what systems are in place? 
for uh, tenured faculty, specifically in SPP, right? We deal obviously with a lot of social justice issues, social policies. Um, and if you have a tenured staff that does not want to have um, inclusive readings from black and brown scholars, if they don't want to update their cu curriculum so that where their research is reflective, um, is well-rounded. Um, and I mean, there've been um, honestly, uh, tenured staff that's been accused of racism and black students will legit not sign up for their class. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is he's also very well connected, um, you know, in the ether, right? So he can help these kids with um, internships, with their uh, capstones, and then potentially for going out into the world. So it, it's not just an experience at, at um, it's not just about um, an experience on campus. You know, it's one of those things where the students don't feel that they can complain because they feel that long term the consequences could potentially impact their, um, you know, their ability to sustain themselves. Oh, it's one. So I'm wondering if anyone who knows has heard of this has, like. Is this new? Is I'm assuming it's not new because I can only imagine how hard it is to try and become a black scholar. I mean, I know the systems that are in place. I'm just wondering what people are doing out there to um, mitigate these issues, I guess. That's, that's a, a very good question. I know if, if Kim Nickerson, Dr. Nickerson, are you, are you on? Or, um, cause I can't see everybody. There was a lot of people and I don't know if, um, uh, Dr. Sharon Fries Britt, Britt was on. These are um, two uh, your faculty members, you know, in our community that that have uh, been involved with BSA from along with Dr. Joseph Richardson. So I don't know if anyone wanted to take us um, because that's that's a really good and very important question. And 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 you're right. <laughs> there, um, and I think people uttered this. Wow, there is a, a a long legacy of systemic racism on campus, and uh, we, you know, we as as staff at Nambu have met with students who, at, at different times, have told us that they have encountered, you know, um, racism within the, within the classroom, and has put them in a very reticent position, where they haven't felt they haven't felt comfortable to, to actually speak up in in class about different things, and so. Um, is there anyone? So, I, mean, I, I see that Anna Patricia still on. I, I think so is Scott Reese. Okay. Well, I guess moreover, um, being that policing is such a hot topic right now, even though most of us that are old enough um, know that this has been going on for forever. Um, but I think if you think about it, you know, policing, you know, what's just as old as policing? Education. It is a system that needs to be dismantled. And one of the things that need to be dismantled is the protection of educators that can, you know, act the way they want with impunity. Right. Um, and it's kind of like, as educators, we're all educators here. What are we really teaching our students? Right. You know, if we can't get that right. Right, right. Anna Patricia, you're on. You respond? Hi, good. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. This is Ana Patricia Rodriguez, and I'm in the Spanish uh, department, Spanish Portuguese, and I've been here at UMD now, ooh, going on 23 years. So I've seen a lot, been on a lot of committees on the President's Commission on um, um, Ethnic um, uh, Affairs Issues. And so um, what um, the, the Professor Esther Rodriguez was saying, um, racism on this campus has a long history, right? And a lot of times, um, both faculty and students don't have um, where to go. Um, you know, we have uh, mentors and, and faculty and staff in the new borough, but there isn't a center, a center for ethnic studies, um, uh, uh, you know, something like that that can um, really address issues. So that I think, you know, is something that we need to push, continue to push for. And also faculty that are, you know, in, interested and they do anti-racist uh, work, uh, learning and teaching. I think this is a good opportunity that we join forces so that we can support our students. So I really appreciate what um, Professor Esther Rodriguez just said. And, um, you know, 
that's also something that you know we can work uh, to to uh, towards, and um, you know we're it would be an opportunity for us to join forces. That's what I would say at this point. But yes, there's a long history and it is problematic. And most of us have faced it on campus. There's been reports and you know they've been hidden. So um, anyways, this uh, merits further critical discussion. Um, Ana Patricia, from your lips to God's ears, but I'm not there yet. I'm not oh. there yet. I, um, I'm actually trying to navigate this same systems, um, but it seems like the more you speak your mind, uh, um, the more you're dismissed, I guess. Um, but I, I'm working right now currently on a civic initiative, and I wanted to talk to you about that anyways. But um, that being said, I just wanted to make sure that everyone knew I'm not a professor. I'm okay. Thanks. I appreciate that. And, and Esther, if you can email me off offline, just at solomon at umd.edu, solomon at umd.edu. We actually have a, a breakout, we have a subcommittee within the uh, Black Fact and Staff Association um, that, is, that is tasked with, with uh, addressing uh, systemic racism, structural racism on campus and have been meeting throughout the summer. And, uh, you know, and at the very least, I think that your, um, you know, what you, you spoke about would be uh, one of the issues that we would welcome, um, you know, with the, welcome the task of deconstructing and actually, you know, putting some some action behind because we are, and I just want to put this, we are an independent organization. So we're not going to tap dance um, for, at least as long as I'm not as president, we're not going to tap dance for, um, you know, high ranking officials on campus, whoever they may be. Our, our job is to serve the interests of our constituents. Um, and so if it, if it means, you know, saying things that make people cringe, but that the right things to say and the right things to bring up, you know, that's what we're, supposed to do as uh, executive board members of BFSA. We are, and that is why we, we moved to become an independent entity and, and to sever ties with the university in terms of our website, not even things like our website or bank accounts are not connected to the university so we can operate as um, uh, autonomously as, as possible. So just email me offline and I look forward to, to working with you. Absolutely, and I mean, I'm Puerto Rican but I guess I don't look the part. So um, I am now utilizing that privilege to get myself into spaces and demand some action. That being said, you know, that might get me into a lot of trouble, but I don't care. I'll do it as long as I'm here. All right. But thank you for All inviting right. me to be a part of that. No problem. Hi, everyone. Thank you um, for sharing, Esther, and thank you, Solomon. I think that um, based on everyone's agreement um, about systemic racism on campus and how it's been a real historical um, issue, it's been embedded in the fabric of our campus, um, what does everyone feel about the systems that are already in place to investigate those sorts of things? Because Dr. Pines made remarks that those things need to be reported and people shouldn't be afraid to report. And although I agree with that, um, I'm not sure how effective the systems or the investigative procedures or departments actually are. Does anyone have any personal experience with um, using different departments on campus to lodge complaints and whether or not those things have been handled appropriately? Um, I can speak on that. Um, my name is uh, Tony Harmon. I am a um, special events uh, supervisor in DOTS, and I'm going through a very, very horrific um, racism and um, discrimination uh, matter. I uh, actually asked him the question about that. And um, I made my complaint to um, the Office of, uh, um, of uh, Sexual Harassment and, um, and Civil Rights. And um, they were, uh, to be honest with you, just cold about it. They are not um, moving with any um, speed. They've kind of swept it to the side. I. Um, had to go and actually file a case with the EEOC, which is in uh, the process now. And once they found out that I had done that, then that was like their um, their excuse to you know not even deal with my case. So I literally can tell you that they've done nothing with regard to my case. Um, um, the the sad part about my case is that all of 
what I've endured is going on under a uh, executive director who is African American. And uh, he has taken the company route rather than um, um, doing what's right. And so it's been very frustrating and very, um, uh, um, it's been, it's been a, 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 a personal hell to have gone through and to be going through. So I, I'm hoping that uh, Dr. Pines will, um, you know, take a very um, serious stance on this. Um, I, I'm, I'm praying that his perspective and his um, past and his experiences will lead to him to have the, the empathy necessary to, um, to really take this serious and to see how systemic it is. He's been here a very long time and that could be a very good thing for us and that he could say, hey, in the time I've been here, I've seen a whole bunch of crap that I um, didn't or couldn't move on before, but now that I'm in uh, on the throne, I can make sure it never happens again. Or he could be a total company man and do exactly what uh, civil rights and sexual misconduct is, which is to kind of sweep things under the rug so that, you know, that the university doesn't look bad or anything like that. I apologize for being uh, wordy, but... Um, uh, it, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a real challenge, you know. Tony, thank you for sharing. And I will tell you that I personally know of two other people that are currently, um, having their investigations handled by, um, that specific department and they are very slow moving. There has been no real change and they do look for, it seems they look for a reason to quickly drop, uh, whatever it is that you're saying needs to be investigated. So, um, you're not alone, and I'm sorry that you've had to deal with this, um, but it, it seems to me like that could be a good first place for us to start as Black faculty and staff members to demand changes um, in the departments who are supposed to be investigating this sort of behavior, mm -hmm. because we need effective things to be implemented. We need effective consequences, and we don't just need optics, and it just appears that most people are having an experience where it just seems like it's optics. Yeah, it's it's crazy because I'm I'm actually um, um, an attorney who's not practicing anymore, but I'm an attorney who's actually practiced labor law before. I have my uh, MBA. I'm uh, pursuing another master's in human resources. I've actually um, applied for positions, having done the exact type of investigatorial stuff that they do. And while and I, I can't say based on how things go if somebody might have been more qualified than me for the job, but I didn't get the position having um, four working on five degrees and 17 years of experience doing that very same thing. So it kind of even made me feel some kind of way about that because if you wouldn't want to pick up somebody who would actually be passionate about investigating these types of things, then what are you doing? I'm being well, honest. What are yeah. you doing? If I'm willing to, you know, and this is before I had the case. If I if I'm willing to say, yeah, this is where I need to be, and this is, and I'm I will be passionate about how um, to investigate these types of things. Then it makes you wonder, you know, what's going on? Who are they hiring? And what is the what's the mission of that department if it's not to hire folk who would be passionate about trying to investigate these things and bring them the, to justice? I think that the, it touches on what Esther was saying before, where once you speak out, you know, you, you put yourself out there, but you, we're not going to go anywhere. So I think we need to be in, um, we need to be united on that front and we all need to keep speaking up, stepping up and, and speaking out. Okay. Solomon. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll end it there, but, um, Esther, I look for you. I got your your um, your message, so I'll I'll look for your email and uh, and look forward to working with you and um, and Selena as well. I mean, Selena, you've been doing great work, so you know, look look forward to to working with you more, you know, as well. There's some really really Likewise. yeah, right on. Let's let's get at it. Let's get at it. Yeah, no more topics. Yeah. So, um, Ms. Carswell, parliamentary, you want to adjourn? And, that's and, it you can yeah and look on be on the lookout there will be a town hall soon and esther 
uh, that those are much longer. Those are like 90 minutes and, and, um, and, you know, I mean, we really take off the gloves with those. So, uh, I, you know, I'll let you know, I don't know if you're on our listserv, but just send me an email if you're not and, and, uh, make sure we get you on that listserv so that you're inundated with, uh, information. All right. Yeah. I had my hand raised, but I don't think anyone saw it, but I didn't want to interrupt or anything. I wanted to know if I could clarify. Um, something that I said before, because I was getting a few uh, private messages about it. Um, just really quickly to clarify, um, when I said that he hasn't met with me, I'm not here or trying to say that to be selfish. When I say he hasn't met with me, I mean, he's not meeting with student activists. So he hasn't met with the president of the Preventing Sexual Assault Organization, um, which is the Women's Sex Sexual Violence um, Awareness Organization on campus that's been around for five years. They've never been acknowledged by the university. Um, he's also not meeting with Mary Kirk, who is the student climate change um, action student group, very committed students in sustainability, not meeting with their president. Her name is Grishma. Um, we're good friends. And I also um, mean this to say like, they have been reaching out to him since February. So I think everything is about perspective. Um, <sighs> I have been trying to do things around this on a student basis. You know, I can only imagine how much, you know, work is going on at the Black faculty and staff level. And that's why when I was like president of the Black Honors Caucus, I made sure to have that um, student faculty dinner so I could meet as many people as possible. You know, now that's not available anymore. But I just don't know really how much more I can do as a student to be taken seriously. And I brought it up to um, the VP of Student Affairs. I said, hey, just letting you know, student activists have never got the justice that they deserve. And she said, you know, she's completely understanding. So honestly, we should have no problems on the student front um, because the VP of Student Affairs, Patty Perillo, said that she is in complete support of us. That is why last, um, maybe two weeks ago now, I emailed President Pines asking that he formally acknowledges us because he went on NPR and the Kojo Nambi, um, Kojo Nambi show and he said that um, we are acknowledging the Black Lives Matter movement on our campus, but that is in no way supporting us because um, the Black Lives Matter movement is a nationwide, you know, you know, and global um, movement. And that's not really pointing back to the community or pointing to who needs help. So um, a big part of what Black Trips Matters is, Black Trips Matters is talking about is the um, Protect UMD um, coalition of students that put together 64 demands and delivered it to administration on November 17th in 2016. I was actually a freshman when it happened. And so I went just as a naive freshman, not really knowing what everything was about. But, um, and it actually happened on my birthday, believe it or not, really random. But um, I really took from that, um, that there's a lot of people, regardless of whether or not we see it, that are hurting from these issues and even more people that support it. So no matter what a person looks like, no matter how young they are, no matter what the skin, color their skin is, or anything, they have very valid things to say. So yesterday, Pines held a um, panel that was moderated from the Dynaback. They didn't talk about Black issues. I came here looking to see that from Pines. And when he um, cut off the, the question about <laughs> unions, it really told me that, um, well, they're telling us to work in unions, really. They're telling us to work in, union, I mean, in working groups. I'm in a designated working group from the president. I'm trying to put it together. To make it <laughs> he just told me, we can stop talking about unions right now. So I just want y'all to think, like, even if you're not part of a union, understand this is a union. Understand every student group is a union. It's the Black Student Union. It was, it was like committees that took us there. So to say we can stop talking about the issues that unions are having, I just want to finish off and say, um, I hope everyone's thinking about the bigger picture and the communities that need the most help and are the most vulnerable. And again, my name is Saba and I'm organizing right now on behalf of Black Terps Matter. Thank you guys so much for giving me this. Thank you, Saba. All right. Um, we can... just, one last, just one last thing, I'm sorry. Um, if anybody is in his ear, has a close, you know, close personal connection to him, maybe a friendship. Um, just a little bit of, of advice from 
humbly from someone who is just getting her career, the real career that she wanted started. Um, leadership in its truest form motivates people to follow them. And what he did today was be dismissive, mm -hmm. evasive, and maybe he was expecting to get, you know, the kitchen sink thrown at him. And if that was the case, then he should have really channeled, you know, a place in him for compassion to be able to answer these questions with the care that they were, um, you know, articulated. Because it takes a hell of a lot of guts for someone like Saba to tell like the highest person right now you know, that could really have an impact on her destiny here at UMD and her experience here at UMD to, to be as honest and as forthright. And if he can't handle that from a student, he's in for a rude awakening. Um, I think he expects or he thinks, and I think a lot of us thought, oh my God, thank God, you know, first black president, I don't know if he's the first, but like, um, who's gonna kind of come in and like really listen to our needs and address them because he is going to be like, he, know, he understands the pains, right? Um, but he needs a lesson in humility and he needs a lesson in listening and he needs a lesson in how to, you know, honestly, sometimes just be able to say, you know what, you're right. You're right. I have not shown up. Maybe I've been a little over my head I'm the president of this huge governmental organization and now I'm in charge of all these people. So, it, you know, it's taking me a minute. And everyone I think here would have appreciated that more than, um, I'm not taking any more union questions. So um, can you guys please, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know if he was talking to you, Brandon, but like, please filter those. I mean, that is not the way you lead. When you think about like historic leaders that have been genuinely impactful, it's been about their vision and I'm not expecting him to be like an order or anything like that, but he needs to, he needs to be able to get, um, he needs to be able to prepare himself for these moments so that that way he does not come off looking condescending and evasive and dismissive. It was very off-putting. Thank you, Esther. And I will just give a little bit of context here. Um, my name is Selena Sarju Singh. I'm an executive board member of AFSME 1072, and we represent um, the employees that are part of the bargaining unit here on the College Park campus, as well as in all the other USM institutions. Um, so we have been fighting for the health and safety of our staff, faculty, and students since March, and we've been in talks with uh, the VP of Student Affairs and our elected officials since March. And I'm, I'm talking about consistent weekly meetings. So those meetings were happening before President Pines um, came into office and we reached out to him immediately and he did grant us uh, two meetings. And so I think that part of what you're hearing is um, what I'm noticing and observing is that President Pines seems to have an attitude of um, well, we've already done X, Y, and Z, like acknowledge what we've already done. And don't you appreciate what we've already done? Well, I've already met with you and it's a very, it's just not thorough, right? Um, so you're meeting us optically at the table, but, but you're not, there's no follow through. Because obviously we don't want to keep having to ask all these questions and bring these things up. Um, the questions he was referring to that were union questions, I believe were personal. That was a personal remark against Ask Me 1072. And I believe that is because he feels like these issues have already been settled and that why are we still bringing these things up. But as the question was phrased in the chat, why is the university willing to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to hire an anti union lawyer instead of coming to the table to bargain over health and safety for our union members um that is that was the question uh and there that was he did not give an answer as to why um that would be the priority for the university to fight the union rather than work with the union and put things in writing that will keep our um, staff members, stu students and faculty safe. And so really, I just wanted to give some context because we have been in talks, we have made demands, we have had protests, we have had petitions, we have had people um, talking to him on social media 
and speaking out because these this COVID is not going away. It is not going away. Um, this is a matter of life and death. It's not something we're going to be quiet about. And so um, I just wanted uh, Saba and everyone else on the call to know that when he was talking about unions, I believe he was specifically talking about AFSCME 1072 because, um, you know, he's, he's sick and tired of hearing from us, but he's not going to stop hearing from us because what we're asking for is what we should be asking for. And that is to be to be able to sit down at the table and bargain over the health and safety of our members and to not be met with anti-union lawyers. That's what we're asking for. We're not gonna stop asking for that. So Selena, why are you saying that? So what, what, one of my goals for the last couple of years is I wanted to see AFSCME have an office on campus because other, other AFSCMEs have, you know, uh, uh, offices of uh, other UMD system schools. And so why we don't have one here, I don't, I don't know. Last, last semester, spring semester, I, I went to the University Senate and, and tried to ask them for support. They turned me down cold. There's something I'm still trying to work on. So hopefully be able to say that could be one of my goals to get you guys an office on campus. So when you go to negotiate for, you know, to, to work for non-exempt staff, they need to have a place where they can actually go as opposed to somebody, the one in somebody's car. Absolutely. And we appreciate that. Thank you so much, Brandon. I think there's an issue with the Senate as well. I think that too seems to be a bit uh, concerned with optics. Uh, is that it? Uh, appreciate all that. Okay. Um, Ms. Cross, was that it? I know. I know. Okay. So I want to thank everybody and, and you know, um, I, get, I don't want to be remiss. Audrey, I, you had your hand. You, you'll get the last word. Yeah, uh, I wanted to say one thing about the message that um, President Pine sent out today. He did not directly want to address the issue of Black Lives Matter on the campus or George Floyd. He sort of like, you know, excuse that. Uh, I don't know anything about that. And I kept hearing his comments and I'm like, who is keeping this man up to date with what is going on? And he is part of Black Lives Matter. That is one of my concerns. He like dismissed it. He didn't want to really talk about it. And another thing that I wanted to talk about was the current and uh, form of retirees on their pensions and how that is going to be affected by the COVID-19 state budgets because a lot of us are at that retirement age, or quite a number of us, a big bulk, and we are concerned about um, how would that affect what is going on on our pensions, regardless of, I mean, regarding the um, uh, budgets for the, for the uh, uh, UN's uh, CP budget. You know, I know there are gonna be cuts. Is that going to affect people's pensions and stuff? Those are critical, serious and you know questions that were not addressed but my main thing is he he was like he didn't know he didn't want to respond to george floyd or black lives matters movement that was amazing to me and i think we need to re-invite him back to you know once we get back on campus or to a town hall meeting he needs to direct that you know he needs to actually give us some kind of feedback on Black Lives Matter and this campus. This is a public university. Come on. And the majority of the people that are on this campus are white. He really needs to address these issues. And he's just, excuse I don't know anything about that. Are you kidding me? Mm. All right. Can, can I, <clears throat> excuse me, this is uh, uh, Ronald Ziegler, senior advisor. Um, I'm on, I just wanted to say that uh, that issue of the two students who uh, carried out the uh, racist uh, mocking, posted the racially mocking poster of George Floyd right. on social media using their UMD accounts. Um, so I brought that up to the, the uh, chief diversity mm -hmm. officer and the vice president for diversity and inclusion. So. If he doesn't know about that, right. it's obviously a very serious communication issue. Exactly. Because I brought that up 
at a recent leadership council meeting mm -hmm. and it was discussed not to my total satisfaction but i did bring it up um i was told that uh and i also brought up a related uh incident involving the Nibiru Culture Center and the Zoom uh, bombing that we had in terms of the police response for these kinds of issues where there's often loopholes. Mm -hmm. And the response I got, again, was not to my satisfaction, but did obviously to me, there's an issue of communication if he doesn't know about that because that definitely was brought up to the Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion. And that's his cabinet. Yes. There you go. And somebody needs to be advising him or common sense would tell me that you ought to know about all of this stuff. You know, ain't no such thing as, oh, well, I don't know anything about this. Are you kidding me? This is everyday news. What, what the hell are you thinking? We know you can't create miracles, but you need to address these issues. These are critical issues. And they need to be addressed. I added my email to the chat and I'm kind of putting that out there um, just as we're talking about this because I've gotten a couple students um, that are first gen that are coming in um, late. They just got their, you know, um, acceptance letter the 31st of July and um, now they're realizing um, that their the max FAFSA loan amount is only 5500 so clearly they don't have enough for the entire year at Maryland. And I'm reaching out to legislators for scholarship money, even though I know that that's the most of it has probably, you know, um, already been allotted out. But if anyone has any resources that we know about, um, if they could please share them with me. Um, and these are one of those things that I really think he should kind of take heed and maybe propose to like the Maryland General Assembly, like, People don't realize that, you know, it's not just about getting in, it's also about having the money to do it. And most people don't have an extra 10 G, $12,000 to send their kids to school. So if they only get 5,500, where are they supposed to get the rest? Um, that's one of my actual personal and professional goals is to get the Department of Education to increase that. So that, that way it can, it can cover any state institution, right? Um, but if anybody knows about any scholarships or any private money that's going around for students of color that are not, you know, that, that need like emergency funds specifically, um, please share them. Yeah, and, and thank you. And your, her email is in the, uh, the chat box. And, uh, um, and so we're gonna have to end it there, but please, you know, follow with her. I know Saba put her information in the, in the chat box as well. Um, let's continue this dialogue and let's continue um, moving it to, to, you know, actions. You know, I, I, I totally agree. And um, Audrey, you know, and Brandon and Ms. Croswell and Dr. Ronald Ziegler, you know, you know, we're going to, we're going to be on this um, within our next e-board meeting and we're going to push on. And um, as I said before, I, I really want to impress, I think our track record speaks for itself that oftentimes, you know, um, you know, we've done the the in, the right thing. The right thing. It might have been the inconvenient thing to uh, you know some folks on campus, but um, we're going to continue to do um, whatever it takes to try to move the compass forward. You know, in regard to social justice, in regard to um, dismantling you know any kind of vestiges of structural racism and um, you know on, on campus, including working with the great the the powerful union. Uh, I'm really proud that we have a, a, a strong working relationship with the, the union. I say that publicly right here, and I've said it publicly before, because, um, you know, without the union, a lot of the gains that, that we made during that workers' rights struggle in 2010 and 2011, quite frankly, wouldn't have been possible. So shout exactly. out to Selena, Stewart, Saul, Sally Davies, Patrick Moran, you know, Mark Seiden, you know, the whole crew. Thank you so much. Uh, look forward to seeing you on the, the town hall. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Solomon. Thanks, everybody. Solomon. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.